All right. Um, so thank you all uh, for organizing this. It's so wonderful to get to hear these papers, to read them as well. Um, thank you all for your kindness as I have my very drafty, drafty version of um, some editing and chopping that I'm doing for my first book project, trying to figure out how to merge my anthropological and my historical work um, and flavor and talking about the senses is something that I'm really trying to work on. It's also really great to um, have read and to go after Christopher's paper because a lot of the literature that um, he went over is what I'm thinking with um, and what I was thinking with when I was in the field. Um, so um, before I go into some of the uh, talking about bovine flavor and taste, I did want to give a quick overview of why on earth I'm talking about animal feed and what exactly animal feed is uh, for the purposes of this paper and for my larger project um, that this is coming out of. And just to give you a sense as an illustration that I made um, of what a uh, given a cow is being fed, a 120 pound ration in uh, Pennsylvania at one of the feed companies that I worked for, and the feed company sold the above the what's uh, marketed in this box here. Uh, so the corn, the soybeans, the beans, and these other additives, and that is what makes up uh, the feed industry. The farmer will make their own silage, haylage, and alfalfa, but there is a, a feed industry that's also related to that. But for the purposes of this presentation, I'm talking about this box. What's interesting about animal feed to me is that it is an industry of industries and a lot of it is coded as an upcycling of byproducts from different businesses. So when you're looking at the longer history of animal feed, you're seeing businesses like Pillsbury, uh, Gold Medal, General Mills, and then Purina and later Cargill um, really being the foundation of the industry, giving their milling products to animals, milling products that are meant for humans and the byproducts going to animals. And then as you're going through the 20th century, you're seeing more chemical companies getting uh, wrapped up in this industry of industries, DuPont, Bayer, Monsanto, Eli Lilly, Pfizer, they're starting to place their chemicals in feed. Um, so the diversifying of these businesses and how animals come to eat our waste is something that's quite fascinating to me. And when we're looking at this, it's really um, parsing out debates about the use of resources um, and human versus non-human consumers within this larger business landscape. Um, so acknowledging that there's layers of consumption and there's not just one food system, but there's multiple food systems meant for the diets of very different species of animals. Um, and for my larger book project, what I'm really trying to do is show that feed and following feed is actually a really great way to think about how certain agricultural practices have been embraced, promoted, and defended as sustainable across uh, the 20th century, before in the 19th century into the 20th century, um, speaking to a lot of the, the tensions that are happening today when thinking about what is sustainable agriculture, what is sustainable livestock agriculture, and um, what feed does or doesn't do within that landscape and that question. So a lot of what I do with my project, the larger project, is speaking to this entanglement of ideas of sustainability with ideas of efficiency, which is very much the marker of um, capitalism and thinking about the, um, the capitalist ethos. And I'm thinking a lot with, um, if for those who are the envir <laughs> environmental historians in the room, um, Samuel Pease Hayes, um, Gospel of Efficiency, and seeing how that's being applied also to animals, not just to uh, larger landscapes when thinking about conservation management. Um, and so what you're seeing is a re-engineering of livestock for meat, milk, and fiber production, a bit of what um, the dovetailing off of some of what Christopher was talking about in the Chinese context, it's happening in the United States context in the early 20th century as well. There is a lot of focus on breeding and in the US context, Gabe um, Rosenberg is doing some great work on this front. Um, but for my purposes, I'm focusing a lot on feeding and how uh, livestock are being re-engineered in this context. Um, so a lot of different animals uh, have this applied to them, um, trying to make them more efficient, re-engineering them to make more meat, make more milk, make more fiber. But I focus on bovines for a few different reasons. One being that the politics of beef and how it's entangled in the history of the United States is quite 
uh, fruitful uh, field of analysis, uh, especially with Josh Speck's book that just came out, um, Red Meat Republic. And then there's some great work by Christopher Deutsch that's um, looking into the politics politics of beef and beef and beef being used to define democracy. Uh, there's also nutritional and cultural values attached to milk uh, um, for, for thinking about bovines and ideas of purity that we've talked about a little bit um, over the course of this conference. Um, it, there, there's some really interesting discussions to be had about milk production in the case of feeding. And finally, what's uh, the, the species, spec like being specific about species, what's really important about this is that cattle are herbivores, but they're also ruminants. So the way that they process different feeds is different than the monogastric chickens and pigs. They're actually able to consume products they are not able to consume and that we are not able to consume. So there's a lot of questions about natural and unnatural um, consumption of food. Uh, what's appropriate for cattle to eat, and that gets suspended and also made almost um, mythical, <laughs> and they, they call it bovine alchemy, the, the process of rumination, these scientists that I've been working with, um, and, and it's suspended in a way that these uh, larger qu questions and debates really come, out, come to the fore in the 20th century. And you're getting a lot of cows. Um, so there's a lot of discussion about hogs eating garbage, a lot of 19th century discussion um, in public health sphere from um, scholars like Catherine McNair. And then you get into the 20th century and actually cows are eating garbage too, if not more different kinds of garbage. So how does this happen? <laughs> and where did this come from? And a lot of what my paper was trying to do and evoke is the importance of flavor in, um, in allowing animals to eat the, these, these very different substances that have very different smells and flavors to them, sometimes not very much flavor at all, um, and, and what the role of flavor does for this. So um, uh, it's an advocacy point for, uh, I'm, I'm plugging for multi-species ethnography. I'm very much influenced by um, people that, that Nicholas and Christopher have cited. Um, Donna Haraway, um, Stefan Heilmerich, um, but also Ibn Kirksey. Um, they, uh, so I, I've gone to farms, I've gone to um, over 12 different farms and really worked with the animals, but I've also visited farms and I've also um, worked with cows uh, with a feed company. And through all of these senses and all of these experiences, that's what I was trying to evoke and write about at the beginning of that paper. And I'm really trying to parse out this um, experience of using human senses to understand how cows might be sensing something, particularly flavor. So smell and taste and like how your mouth salivates was just something that I found really interesting in the field and was trying to evoke in that writing. And for purposes, uh, for those who did read the piece, this is the slimy silage that I found um, from that one barn. And it's hard to tell in a picture, but when I was in, my, going back to my ethnographic notes, I just had an all caps slimy, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, because it just smelled so bad. And I took this picture and it just didn't do it justice. And um, this silage looks quite different from this silage, but you have to be careful with how skill, how these um, sensing skills are coming together, um, because this is actually a silage made with rye, this is silage made with corn, and so the, the uh, color and the texture and the smell is going to be different. Uh, so some of the questions that came to me in the field and are actually quite appropriate for what's happening with scientists, feed company specialists, and farmers in the archive, is what can animals eat and what should they eat and what do they like to eat? Um, and how do we know what animals like and desire and feed? And what my, per way of a short conclusion, my observation in the field was that humans use their own senses to evaluate how cattle will respond to feed. Um, smells, tastes, but also observations, how many times they're going back to the feed bin. Are they constantly eating? Are they refusing the feed? Are they pushing some feed away to get to other kinds of feed? Um, these sorts of things. But also um, humans have um, used their, oops, sorry, humans have used their own senses to evaluate what is good, natural, and appropriate food for cattle in the long run. Um, and so thinking about human bovine relationships, I again, very much love dovetailing off of Christopher's thoughts. And I would like to think more about affect and because um, it's not just anthropocentrism here, there's also a reaction that's happening with cattle. 
and these relationships, but that's not to say it's not happening. So you see with this feed company cartoon, speaking to gender, <laughs> um, as well as anthropocentrism for this young calf that's going to be a heifer that's going to be a cow and how Purina is advertising that in this cartoon. There's a lot to unpack in these layers of how they're coming together and I'm hoping to do that in my larger project. So uh, to kind of uh, connect with some of the discussions that we're, we were having yesterday, um, I, seeing a lot of sensory science on the part of farmers, feed companies, and um, scientists um, especially in standardizing feed. Good morning. Was that two minute? Two minute or one minute? Doesn't matter. Two anyway, minutes. Thank you. Um, um, so scientists are standardizing feed into quantitative uh, nutritional touch phone, touchstones, and with this, once inferior feed is now considered viable feeding sources. And a lot of scholars have talked about this process, but one of the things I really want to emphasize is this is really messy and really difficult to actually uh, play out on the ground. And one of the things I'm thinking with is uh, the entanglement of capitalist, capitalism and maintenance and how care is kind of fitting in the middle of this. And I'm thinking with um, Hui de la Bella Casa's work um, and, and a little bit with Latour in thinking about care, um, but uh, care for animals and how that's uh, being challenged and also uh, evoked and performed uh, through flavor. <laughs> um, and so I, I'm gonna go through these slides real quick because I'm, I'm running out of time. This is the, the flavor chart that I had in my um, paper that I talked about, all those different flavors. And then this is a little piece from um, the Ernest Dichter papers at the Hagley, speaking to um, a, a farmer, speaking about uh, how he's feeding his animals and the different types of skills and senses he needs to use to know what's good for a given animal. And it's very individualized. It's not talking about the herd, it's talking about an individual cow in this case. Um, so the development of the sweet feeds market comes out of this concern for flavor and humans being obsessed with sweet flavors and seeing that cows might also be obsessed with sweet flavors. But one of the things that's interesting is that molasses is thought first as not a great product and then is thought about um, as a better product. So you're not seeing molasses talked about explicitly in marketing campaigns, but then you're seeing it later talked about explicitly in campaigns. And this has a lot to do with what's happening in the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act, which is not just affecting human food, it's also affecting cattle feed and how they're labeling it. Um, there's more I can say about uh, this split off that happens between professional organizations and then coming back together about sweet feeds in particular. And it has to do with molasses uh, processing and how it's so much more difficult to process molasses into cattle feed um, than other products out there. Um, this debate then goes into uh, various different hearings related to the Pure Food and Drug Act. Um, people worrying about if you're using molasses, perhaps that's an adulterant because it's masking inferior feeds. If you're tricking the cow, it's the same thing as tricking the farmer. Um, but also this debate of, well, isn't this a good thing because cows can't eat the same things as humans? Why don't we make it that they can eat the things we can't in a more pleasurable way, palatable way for them. Um, so this gets suspended, debated, and then integrated into the system. And then this will be my last slide, um, speaking to how it's actually marketed. Um, with cows in mind, also thinking about palatability with this particular advertisement. But I'll end um, my presentation <laughs> with this quote from this specific advertisement. I think it speaks a lot to like the kin making that's happening with cattles and humans. Quote, cattle are just like children. They love sweets. Sweet is fattening. Sweets make them thirsty. Feed them this specific molasses feed and they will eat, drink, and put on fat. So I'll leave it there. Uh, thanks so much for your time and attention.